This is Flippin' Junkie Podcast, episode 43. Welcome to the Flipping Junkie Podcast. My name is Danny Johnson, former software developer turned house flipper, flipping hundreds of houses. Each week, we bring you interviews, strategies, stories, and motivation to help you get started flipping houses and on your way to becoming your own boss and achieving financial freedom. Thanks for spending time with me today. Now let's get to it. All right, welcome back to the Flipping Junkie Podcast. Glad you guys are listening to this podcast. There's a lot of other real estate investing podcasts, and I've got a lot of friends that do podcasting for real estate investing. So I do appreciate that you listen to uh, all of us and and especially ours, the Flipping Junkie Podcast. So thank you for tuning in, listening. Uh, we're right in the middle of a series of podcast episodes. It's probably going to span about a year uh, where we're basically giving you a real estate investing a f- house flipping course uh, through podcast over the year once once every week. And so that'll end up being, I'm sure, well over 50 uh, episodes starting from the beginning of Foundation Mindset, uh, getting your thinking right to be an entrepreneur and then moving into how to get funding for properties to be able to buy these houses, to fix them up, flip them and make incredible profits. And then uh, now we're we're moving into where we're talking about marketing. We've had a couple episodes about direct mail. And in the last episode, I, I did mention that this one would be an episode with Tom Crawl about, uh, you know, the, the best list to get for your direct mail. And I apologize, but that's going to be put off for a couple episodes uh, because of a timing conflict. So a scheduling conflict. So we're going to move that. So uh, sorry if you expected that today, but uh, that'll be in a couple episodes. What I wanted to talk about today is driving for dollars. And this is what Melissa and I started with, uh, what, 13 years ago. It's what we, the first thing that we went out and started doing. And uh, I have to tell you, I really enjoy doing it. And I still, to this day, enjoy doing it because it's relaxing. And I, I feel like I'm, you know, out really, uh, you know, f- seeing what the neighborhoods are like, seeing what the market is like, beating the street and just getting out there and um, seeing what's going on. And it's it's good to know your market. It's good to know, have that good of a um, understanding and, you know, from being out there and driving around, see which neighborhoods are being rehabbed, which houses, which neighborhoods still have a lot of houses that, that need repair but have, uh, you know, quick turnaround, quick short days on market where houses are selling fast. I mean, those are awesome neighborhoods to get into because uh, you, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, housing stock in there that needs repairs uh, that you can target and you can buy and then be able to sell quickly. And it's just the perfect thing. So getting out there and seeing what's happening, you know, you can read, you know, charts and spreadsheets all day long. But that to me is, not, you know, I just can't do that kind of thing. I'm not that type of person. I, I'd rather be out driving around looking at this stuff, seeing what's going on. So um, I don't know. Driving for dollars has always been a, a great thing for, for me and Melissa and uh, what we've done in our business. And our first deals were from driving for dollars. So uh, I, I think it's it's still a very viable uh, way to find great deals in 2016 and beyond. And so this is driving for dollars in 2016 is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, Before I get into the episode, I wanted to quickly talk about uh, Lead Propeller websites. We've got a lot of cool things coming up with Lead Propeller websites, some some, uh, advances and, you know, how things change pretty quickly on the Internet. And we we stay on top of that. And uh, that's one of the benefits of of having a service like Lead Propeller for your real estate investor website is that uh, we do stay on top of of what's happening and, and, you know, keeping with the changes so that uh, you – can rank well in the search engines and get great deals, uh, great leads to your website so that you can flip them. And, you know, I wanted to quickly talk about because there's, you know, I, I hear other people that, uh, you know, say that they're investors and, you know, offer software and websites and things like that. But when you look at, you know, sort of the background, it's not really active investors. You know, it's the you know, people, you know, that have flipped some houses in the past several years ago or bought a rental property and consider that real estate investing. And, you know, the, the real problem with that and the, the real uh, issue there is that you're, you're sort of missing out on all the experience that active flippers have with uh, working with motivated sellers and understanding their point of view and what they're looking for and, and, and how to work with them. And so that's sort of the benefits that you get from active flippers that provide that sort of information because it's a working knowledge um, it's, it's knowledge gained through experience, and it's it's really priceless. I mean, there's there's so much insight to be had when you uh, work with people like that. So, 
just want to mention that as a part of, you know, a benefit of, of really working with uh, us and, and Lead Propeller and REI Mobile. One example of that, uh, just to make the point a little bit more clear, is, uh, you know, with Internet marketing, you know, there's there's a lot of studies out there, a lot of different information that you can find. And it's kind of hard to know what's right and what's wrong and what would work in our industry and what wouldn't. And so the problem is I see a lot of times that some of the information out there gets used uh, and, and it, it's shown to work in a certain industry and then that's just transferred over automatically assuming it would work for real estate and for marketing and motivated sellers. And it's just not good advice. So uh, one, one key thing with that is sort of like if you look at uh, conversion rate testing, so you want your website to convert better. So more of the traffic that comes actually fills out the form and submits it to you so you have the lead. And so that's conversion optimization. You can you have a website that converts it really well. And if you look at studies that show that um, the shorter the form, the less fields in the form, the higher conversion rate you'll have. So that just sounds great, right? So I'm going to go ahead and strip out all of, most of the information on my form and just ask for their uh, name and email address or something like that. And you might think I'm going to get a lot more leads now because I'm not requiring a phone number not requiring an address and things like that. So the problem with that, though, is if in our business, you know, the person that talks to the seller first honestly has a huge edge over anybody else. And so you might get a couple more here and there, the people that didn't want to put in a phone number that submit their lead information and you have their email address. Um, But you can't contact those people very quickly. You can send an email, hope it doesn't go to their spam box, and hope that they respond to you and you're going to be able to communicate. But if they then go to another website and submit a form that required their phone number and they do that, that person's calling them right away. And so they've just made first contact and they have the huge advantage. So it's knowing things like that, you know, knowing that historically with my website that I generate my own leads for my house flipping business. uh, And whenever I don't get a phone number, I'm losing out because it makes it really hard to get in touch with those people because they're they're not responding to email or the email might go, be going to their spam folder. Uh, you could have all of those issues that you don't control. I'd rather have a phone number that I can get in touch with them right away and uh, know that they're going to receive that. And, uh, you know, if not, then get a message and I can keep trying to call them. So, uh, you know, shorter form isn't necessarily always better. I would take fewer leads which and it doesn't even affect it that much from what i've tested so it's it's getting that phone number is very important so if you do have a real estate investor website make sure that you have the phone number and the form and uh, that's just like an example of one of those things that's the benefit of lead propeller websites with us being real active investors doing motivated seller marketing uh, for leads because we understand and have worked with thousands of motivated sellers over the years so uh, if you haven't checked out lead propeller uh, go to leadpropeller.com and check that out So anyway, I'll go ahead and get into the show now, and we'll talk about driving for dollars in 2016. Going to have some great tips about uh, different things that you can use now that's available that wasn't available when we got started driving for dollars. Uh, Some great technology that you can use, uh, most of it free, and uh, information on how to best drive for dollars to maximize your time and get some awesome leads and deals. All right, here we are, driving for dollars in 2016. It's crazy, it's already 2016, and who knows, you might be listening to this and it's 2018 or something like that, and uh, it's still great advice. Uh, Maybe the apps have changed a little bit and some of the software probably improved more and things like that by then as things change so quickly, but, uh, you know, most of this advice is still going to hold true because um, really most of it is what I had learned 10 years ago and still apply today, so or 10 or 13 years ago. So it's it's just information that, uh, you know, driving for dollars has been around for a long, long time, and it's just an excellent way to find great deals. So some people might not know what driving for dollars is, and, you know, real quick, that's just locating properties that are vacant and or in need of repair. So it's it's called driving for dollars because you're driving around locating potential flip deals that will put money in the bank for you. And you're just driving around looking for potential opportunities by by actually visually looking at these, visually looking. So I don't know there's any other way to look, but you know, looking at these houses as you drive through these neighborhoods and writing down the addresses. And then the the thing is to find the owners through tax assessor websites and other means, 
and direct mailing them or calling them and trying to see if they'd like to, to get an offer to buy the house because it's likely vacant or likely in a situation where the seller just, ha- you know, the house is, has so much deferred maintenance that they, they can't afford to fix it up and there might be some other issues that they're, situations that they're facing um, that has caused those problems and uh, might uh, put them in a position where they'd be interested in getting a cash offer from you to buy the house. So that's what driving for dollars is. And I'm going to be talking about when to drive for dollars, where to drive for dollars, how to do it correctly, and then what to do after you get the addresses of these houses, and then answer some common questions that people have about flipping houses, and then some ideas in there as far as you know apps and stuff like that to use. So it's going to be a great show. Let's go ahead and get right into when to drive for dollars. And I want to start with this because I think the times that you drive – around these neighborhoods has a big impact on how many uh, properties you can find that are vacant that might not appear to be vacant uh, just on the surface as you drive by at 10 miles an hour. So uh, let's talk about the best time. So I prefer days like trash day. So the day that uh, trash is going to be picked up, people will have the trash cans out to the curb. And if you drive you know, buy at 10 miles an hour, you can just be kind of looking for the properties where there's no trash can at the curb. And then you can look and focus on those properties and consider whether you think that they're vacant or not, so that you're not having to to inspect every single property as you're driving by. So that's when I like to do it. And uh, another time is if you see that a neighborhood is getting phone books or something delivered, uh, you can drive through and, uh, you know, like a week later or something like that. And if there's still the phone book on that porch, it's probably vacant. And, uh, you know, vacant doesn't always necessarily mean vacant for a long time. Could be on vacation, could be any kind of situation where the people might drive into their garage and never go through the front door so they don't even know the phone book's there. But you don't need to concern yourself so much with that because, you know, really what you're doing is, you you know, you're going to be sending some letters and stuff like that. So even if the house isn't vacant, uh, you could get lucky. They could still want to sell but really all you're out is, is a couple bucks and sending several letters and stuff like that. So I wouldn't fret too much over whether the house is absolutely vacant or not. If there's signs showing it might be, I would go ahead and write down the address. So so trash day when phone books are delivered, things like that, uh, when when mail is being delivered. So if it's typically around 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock that a neighborhood's getting uh, their mail delivered by the postman, it's a good day to drive because uh, you can talk to that mailman and uh, ask him, or her where the vacant houses are and a lot of times they'll tell you that one over there is vacant that one's vacant and you can get a lot of info from them and uh, you know one smart way to handle that is to give them a business card for one so that you know they know that you're not just looking to break in or vandalize the house but number two is what you want to do is set up a bird dog referral system so that these uh, uh, postal employees will will give you a call or write give you a list of these vacant houses and uh, you can work out some kind of referral thing where maybe you can give them some sort of a gift if, uh, you know, they send you a lead to one of these houses that you end up buying. So that's a great thing that you can work out doing. And another time that you would find beneficial to drive for dollars is, is when people are usually home. And what I like about that is, you know, basically if there's nobody, no car in the driveway when everyone else is home, you know, it's a good sign that that's a house that you can you know, look at and pay a little bit more attention to. And some of the ones that may have looked vacant um, could have a car sitting in the driveway in the evening after work. So you would have thought it was vacant, but it turns out it's not. Uh, So situations like that. And then my last time that I want to talk about is the time that you are able to do it when you can bring your family along. And so that might not be those same times as trash day or when everybody else is usually home. But you know, the reason why I bring this one up is because it's it's good to include your family, especially your spouse in this business. And I, I think driving for dollars is one of those things that everybody can get behind and everybody can have fun doing, uh, you know, make a game of finding which house, how many people, you know, who finds the, the vacant house first kind of deal. And uh, it can be it can be pretty fun. And, and you can get to know different parts of the city that you may never even knew existed uh, different little hot spots or something, different restaurants. So it, it's a good thing for everybody, and I think it's a good way to get everybody involved in the business, uh, to get behind you in this business. And that's a big part of it. I think a lot of people fail because uh, their family's not behind them, and it, it's just an uphill struggle 
And when you don't have people there supporting you in it, it makes it pretty difficult. So uh, those are all the times that I feel are, are beneficial, the great times to drive for dollars. And I'm going to have these notes, all this, all these key points and things like that on the show notes page at flippingjunkie.com slash 43. Flippingjunkie.com slash 43. You'll be able to get um, all of these notes. I'll have them there uh, for you to download. So uh, where to drive for dollars? Now, this is equally important. You want to pick neighborhoods that are at least 15 to 20 years old. Uh, Newer neighborhoods don't usually have a lot of houses that are in disrepair or vacant. And that's the main reason for that. If there's a lot of activity in a neighborhood where investors are buying and it's not that old, uh, go ahead. You know, you won't be dry or writing down as many addresses, but maybe those are better deals that other people aren't finding. So, but the general rule of thumb, you know, is to find ones, you know, start with the neighborhoods that are, that are older though. And you want to find where other investors are rehabbing, flipping houses, where it's a good sign of interest in an area. Some areas are really bad and you won't find a lot going on in the way of uh, people flipping houses and stuff like that. So you want to be sort of where there's some action so that you know that, um, you know, if you go, do get a deal, whether you wholesale or fix and flip it or rent it or whatever, you're going to have a great, great uh, possibility to do different things with the property. And in previous episodes on direct mail, I think it was, that we've uh, talked about how to find these areas where other investors are, are flipping houses um, that you can do from the computer even uh, using list source. I think there was an episode with Lamar Cannon on there if you want to check that one out where he talks about using list source without paying for the list to find out what zip codes have the most cash sales. And so you can uh, check out that episode to, to find that out. And then another consideration you want to have for where to drive for dollars is basically where you don't fear for your life. And in this one, you might think, well, it's kind of funny, you know, but there's some war zones and stuff like that. But seriously, there's some places in any city that you, you just don't want to be in. It's You might be able to make some money there. Great. You know, if that's your thing, awesome. Uh, for me, no amount of money is really worth losing my life over. And uh, you might be thinking, oh, come on, you know, it's not that bad in some places. But, but really, <laughs> I mean, we've had some experiences with some some things, you know, with people uh, jumping out in front of the vehicle when you're driving by and, you know, trying to even, I, I had a buddy that even had a uh, you know, crackhead or something try to jump into his truck. He had his passenger window open while he was driving by and just uh, crazy things like that. And maybe even one situation where I think it was probably even a possible carjacking that uh, we, you know, avoided. And uh, so you, you just have to be really careful. And I don't recommend the war zone stuff. And one quote that I always remember whenever I talk about that is from Ron Legrand. He, he always was saying, don't go rolling through a war zone driving a fancy car wearing lots of jewelry. It's just not smart. Don't do it. So if you have a fancy car, lots of jewelry, please don't drive through war zones driving the car or wearing the jewelry. All right. I prefer neighborhoods just under the median value for the city because uh, we fix and flip and want the price range with the biggest pool of buyers. So we want to target those areas where if we have a house for sale after we fixed it up, uh, we've got a ton of potential people looking for a house in that price range so that we have a chance of selling it for top dollar and fast. So we've talked about when to drive for dollars, and we talked about where to drive for dollars. And now we're going to talk about how to actually do it. So, you know, you might say, well, all you got to do is drive through and look for the vacant houses. But there's, I think, a little bit more to it. You want to make sure that you're not going over the same areas you've already covered and some neighborhoods most neighborhoods are not grids anymore not not grid streets so it's kind of hard to know whether you've covered every street in that neighborhood and you really don't want to miss pockets because other investors that are driving dollars might be missing those pockets as well and so you want to make sure that you cover every little nook and cranny and you know car gps makes it pretty nice to be able to see where you are in relation to what other streets are in the area uh, and then you know, one thing that, that's come up recently that, that you can use is um, uh, an app for your phone or iPad. You know, just look, do a search for route tracker. So you can do a route tracker that tracks where you've been and to show you which streets that you've been on so that you know what you've already covered. So that's super, super awesome so that you know that you get total coverage of these areas when you're driving for dollars. Now, I prefer to have somebody with me. Uh, when I'm driving for dollars so that I can focus on the left side of the street while the other person focuses on the right side of the street. Because after doing it by yourself for a while, you'll notice that having your head on a swivel isn't very effective and it's going to wear you out a whole lot faster and you're going to just be done and ready ready to get back to the office or home 
uh, sooner than than later. And it's also just better because you're you know having conversations, having fun, and and uh, you'll tend to do it do it more often and have somebody to kind of go back and forth on whether you think something's vacant or not and get a second opinion. So uh, the next one is to watch out. Don't be so consumed with trying to find these vacant houses that you run into a parked car or people. And I've heard of this happening. Thank God I've never done it myself. Um, and, and it was a parked car, not a person. But you don't want to have either situation happen to you. Uh, so just be careful, okay? Drive slow enough and don't be trying to text the address while you're still rolling and all that kind of stuff. Uh, drive slow. Look for signs that a house vacant or might have a situation where the owners would consider selling. So what are those signs of being vacant or being a situation where they would consider selling so neglect you know grass is overgrown trees have never been trimmed broken windows trash in the yard etc etc just a general look of neglect and uh, after driving for dollars for a while you'll you'll notice what what those are it's just super obvious everybody else's yards cut and then this one has two foot tall grass uh, newspaper door hangers or other solicitations piled up on the porch that's usually a giveaway as well um, it's just amazing. You'll see how much actual marketing is done that way whenever you see some of these houses that have been vacant for months. I mean, it's just amazing how much stuff accumulates. Uh, another thing is missing or tagged electric meters. So if you can see the meter on the house, um, a lot of times with vacant ones in certain places, they'll just take the whole can so that uh, people won't be stealing electricity or something. But uh, other, other times they'll tag them with like a red tag or something. You'll have to find out what your city or, or town or area uses to mark or show that there's no power to a, a property and because uh, no power you know nobody's likely living there if there's no power and e- even if somebody is living there and there's no power it's probably a horrible situation and one where they would likely be interested in getting cash so uh, and then also like peeling paint rotted wood boarded up windows vandalism stuff like that anything to the extent to be something that's been neglected for a couple years or so uh, without taking care of the property is a sign that something's happened in somebody's life and and they might be interested in in, um, you helping them out by by giving them a cash offer uh, so they can move into a nicer home or something. So what you do when you find these addresses is write down the addresses on a pad of paper. It's the old school way. You can use your phone to record a voice memo, which is a little bit safer. Or you can use an app uh, like HomeSnap. That's H-O-M-E-S-N-A-P. And with HomeSnap, you take a picture of the subject property. It will give you the bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage, estimate of value, sales history, uh, whether it's in foreclosure, bank-owned, all that kind of stuff. So it allows you to also save those properties into your account so you can keep them organized. So that's that's one thing you can check out is a HomeSnap app. And then uh, what do you do after you get these addresses? So once you compile these addresses, once you have a list of them, you're going to need to find a how who owns that house. And the most common way is to check the tax assessor uh, for the county or, you know, parish or, you know, whatever you call it and where you are. Uh, find their website. Most of them are all online these days. You can do a search by property address. And it'll give you the address of where the tax bill is being sent. And that's typically almost always the owner. And when you do that, sometimes you're going to notice that the tax bill address is the same as the property address. And you're going to say, well, it's obviously vacant. How come, you know, the tax bill is going to the vacant house? Well, uh, a lot of times there will be forwarding, mail forwarding, and sometimes there just won't. Something will have happened. Nobody will have done forwarding, and you'll need to find those people. And to me, that's, that's sort of gold, you know, getting those letters back. So you want to mail anyway, even if that address is the same and it's obviously vacant. Mail it to that address anyway, first class. Uh, letters either going to get forwarded or it's going to get returned to you with the forwarding address or letting you know that it's just vacant or something. And when you get those, you know that those are ones to focus on with a little bit more effort. And you can find people all kinds of ways these days. I mean, it's not really that hard. You can use social media, look for their names and, and location. Uh, websites like whitepages.com. Um, and you want to get more advanced, you get a paid solution like TLO.com. It's TLO. You'll have to jump through some hoops and apply and stuff to get an account, but it's it's a great skip tracing um, way to find people. But a lot of times you can find them, you know, without doing any of that. And it's just, you know, interacting with people. It's just getting out there and talking to people. And so you know a house is, is vacant. You, got, you sent the letter out. 
It didn't get forwarded. It got kicked back to you, says the house is vacant. So what you can do is you can drive over to that property, go to the neighbor's houses and ask them. Just say, hey, look, you know, I noticed this house is vacant. I tried to mail them a letter. It uh, got bounced back. And uh, what I do is fix up houses and I, I sell them so that, uh, you know, a great family can move in next door and have a house that they're proud of, um, you know, and fix that eyesore next door to you. And just, you know, see if you can find out what the situation is, who the homeowner is, and, and if they have any contact information for them. And a lot of times they do. And so it's just a matter of taking time to get out there and do that or hire somebody else to do it. Um, so don't just throw those away. Don't just send them out and get them sent back to you and throw them in the trash can. All right, so some common questions that people have about driving for dollars. What if a house looks like it needs lots of repairs, but it has a car in the driveway? You know, would you write that down? Is that one thing that you would consider sending a letter to? Cars in the driveway, you know, it might not be vacant. They could be living there, whatever the situation is. So the car could be sitting there because the owner's deceased. It might have been sitting there for a while. Could be any number of things, but don't get too concerned about all of it. The level of disrepair is enough to warrant me mailing letters to them to see if they're interested in selling. How many addresses, uh, on to the next question now, how many addresses would be considered typical for a good investment area? And now this is a question about how many should you expect to get as you drive these areas? And, you know, if you're not getting numbers like this, it might just be the area. You know, maybe pick a, a an area that's a little bit older or something. But I'd say that about 20 or 30 addresses, you know, somewhere in there, 20 to 30 addresses per hour is a good haul for a typical neighborhood for, for flipping. If you're targeting more rental type areas, you know, places that are a little bit more on the scale of working class down to war zone, um, you know, there's a big spread in between there. It's not just from there to there, but you should be seeing more around 40 to 50 addresses per hour in some of those neighborhoods where you have boarded up houses. Uh, so you can gather lists pretty quick, you know, by doing this of, of these uh, prime opportunities. And if you look at direct mail, you know, if you're sending out some sort of blanket thing, you know, or even just to absentees, you know, you don't know what shape those houses are in. You don't know if they just rented it to somebody or they've been renting it to somebody for 30 years and have no interest at all in selling the place. Uh, but when you see these houses like this that are in disrepair um, or vacant, you know, it's a lot more likely that, if you do get the call, it's going to be a good call or that you send them out. You should have a higher return, a higher response rate for your mailings uh, by doing uh, driving for dollars. So the next question, what if I can't find the address for the house? Sometimes you'll plug them into the website uh, for the tax assessor and it, it won't find anybody. It won't find any address. Um, you you might have the wrong address. So try maybe adding a, you know, two because it's usually odd and even on one side of the street. So try adding two or subtracting two from the number that you have. If you're driving and you can't see the address of the house, like the numbers aren't on the house, you don't know what the address is, just look at the neighbor's house and look at the neighbor on the other side and then you know, put it somewhere in the middle and, and mark it that you guessed it because you might have to do some adding and subtracting of two uh, to find the actual property. So how often should you drive the same area? So I'd say every year you should should be sufficient to drive to discover new vacants and to find out whether old ones are still vacant. Because after, after you hit an area several times over the years, you'll start to see the property that's like one that you, you know you've seen several times. It still looks horrible. And you're going to want to spend more time and more money to skip trace or do something to find that owner of that property. Um, to keep track of all of it, you know, I, I print out a map from Google Maps of the areas that I'm driving, and I just circle and outline the, that day where I drove, and then I mark on that inside of there, I, I put the date. So I know when the last time I was, I, I drove each of those areas, and to know which areas you drove, because you could get busy, and two months later, you haven't driven for dollars at all again, and you kind of forget where you've already been. So I always keep track of that stuff. It doesn't take long to do it. Uh, is there anything else I can do if it's an obvious that the house is vacant, but they're not responding to my letters? So let's say that there's a house that you found, and it's definitely vacant. I mean, like, the, the door is wide open, there's broken windows, um, all kinds of things showing that, like, nobody is living there. And you're sending letters, but they're not responding to you. And, you know, I've already answered this. Basically, you basically you go talk to the neighbors because they've got a house that's next door. It's an eyesore, obviously vacant and try to find the whereabouts of the owners. 
And with technology these days, you know, with Google Maps and, and um, with their, their, their uh, what's it called, the, um, you know, the map view where you can walk, you can actually like walk through them down the street. So you can hire somebody to drive for dollars virtually for you. They can walk those neighborhoods using Google Street View. And, um, and that's just at maps.google.com. You put in an address there and then you just drag that little guy onto the map. And uh, you, you, it's like you're just walking down the street. So uh, you can have somebody in the Philippines working for several dollars an hour, four bucks an hour or something, walking down these streets for you, looking at these pictures side to side, looking for these vacant houses. And obviously there's going to be some, some missed properties, um, some properties that are included that aren't very good candidates. But if your time's super valuable, and it should be, you know, you should give that a try or consider doing something like that. And another thing to be aware of is sometimes those maps aren't uh, and the pictures aren't updated often. So that could they could be walking down a street of, uh, you know, uh, something historical, like a two year gap, you know, from when those pictures were taken and what what the reality is of the thing. So you might want to check first to make sure that the the pictures of the areas of where you're going to have them do this have been updated at, at least, you know, within the last several months or six months or something. But um, if you have people doing that just to look for the obviously super vacant ones, heck, why not, you know? Um, they can be a little bit more strict. Your criteria for the properties they're sending to you can be a lot more strict um, so that you're only finding those really horrible, hideous ones. So awesome, awesome tip there. And with that technology, they're doing that on the computer. They can get, grab a, a screen grab of each of the ones that they are submitting to you. So not only do you have the address, but you have a picture of them as well. Uh, can be very, very helpful. And, of course, you can always outsource to, to college kids or, or somebody to, to do this for you in your area, actually get out there and drive around and, and do that. So that's driving for dollars, and um, we're going to be covering what to mail people for different lists, including drive for dollars, in these other episodes uh, where we're talking with people about uh, doing direct mail because that's a, what most – of the highly successful investors. That's where they get a lot of their deals is from, from doing that. So hope you guys enjoyed this episode and got a lot out of it. Uh, Driving for Dollars has found us some awesome deals, including some of our, our first ones. And even to this day, we still are, are getting deals and buying houses from houses that we saw where we were driving around. So definitely doable, still works, works very well and uh, works for people that are working with a budget Uh, If you're just getting started in this and you don't have a huge budget to spend on blanketing stuff with direct mail, uh, driving for dollars, I think, is a great way to get started because the, you know, the the properties that you're mailing to about, the properties that you're mailing about have, you know, definite signs of of, uh, neglect and and signs of situations that the homeowners are facing um, that would uh, warrant them, you know, wanting to consider your cash offer much more so just do it just get out there start driving for dollars write down some addresses and um you know don't don't be the person that gets scared if you're new and drive down write down some addresses and then stick them on a list and just build that list up till you have about 500 and never mail because it's just a lot easier to stay in your comfort zone and keep building that list instead of mailing because you might get a call you've got to do it you know you you go out there and get that first 50 addresses and send letters to every one of them. It could be as simple as, my name is Danny. I was driving through the neighborhood. I saw this house that uh, looks like it might be vacant, look like it needed some repairs. Um, you know, I'd like to, to take a look at the house so I can make you a cash offer. I'm looking to buy a house in the area that needs repairs. Uh, please give me a call and then your phone number. It's as simple as that. It's not rocket science. Um, just do something. Get the calls. See that it works. Keep doing it. And uh, you'll end up with a deal before you know it. Have a great week. We'll talk to you uh, next week. We'll have the next uh, podcast episode for you.